thank you for uh, organizing, moderating, and inviting me. And for those of you who ran this morning, uh, congratulations for being done and already back here. So I think I got the longest assigned title of any talk in the entire uh, symposium, which brings up the fact that there's really not enough time that I can address the, everything that was on the title. So I'm going to uh, just try and briefly focus on a few of these issues. And I'm going to start with a case who's a 35-year-old male who was recently diagnosed with ileocolonic Crohn's disease. Uh, he's now steroid dependent. And the treating physician recommends infliximab and azathioprine for the person. Uh, the patient is concerned that he saw on the internet that this might increase his risk of getting lymphoma uh, and has basically three key questions for you. Uh, does immunosuppressant therapy increase the risk of lymphoma? Uh, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And is there anything that I or he can do to decrease the risk of lymphoma? Well, let's start with the thiopurines. These are data from an old meta-analysis that we published over, I think, a decade ago now, where uh, if you pulled together these six studies, um, even with a limited number of lymphomas, there was evidence that patients with inflammatory bowel disease who were treated with thiopurines had an incidence rate of lymphoma that was about four times higher than that of the general population. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, the SASAM study uh, confirmed these observations, uh, showing that in those patients who were treated with thiopurines, compared to the general population, they were about five times more likely to uh, be diagnosed with lymphoma. But I think the most important data that came out of SASAM was not that. I think that uh, the most important data were that those patients who had discontinued thiopurines appeared to have an incidence rate of lymphoma that went back to that of the general population. And this is subsequently, uh, if you read this month's gastroenterology, you'll see that this has been confirmed in a, in a second study. Now, the question of biologics is much more difficult. Corey Siegel published this meta-analysis uh, some time ago, uh, suggesting that patients who were treated with anti-TNF therapy were about three times more likely than the general population to be uh, diagnosed with lymphoma. But the hard part here is to tease out what part of that effect is from the biologic and what part of that effect is from the thiopurines that many of these patients were taking simultaneously. Here are, are a handful of more recent studies that have tried to lend some insight to this. In green um, are additional studies of patients uh, receiving uh, thiopurines currently without anti-TNF therapy. And again, uh, in these three studies, you see a generally an increased incidence of lymphoma in all of them. Uh, in blue, you can see patients who are treated with TNF therapies either without thiopurines or with previous thiopurine therapies. In two of these, there were no cases of lymphoma. And then in, in one, there was a single case. And then in red are combination therapy. Um, and here you'll see that the, uh, the relative risk estimates are a bit higher than in the green uh, and certainly higher than in the blue, although there is no direct comparison between those that I can point you to uh, to confirm whether or not combination therapy is truly any greater risk than thiopurine monotherapy. So if you uh, ask the question, does, th does immunosuppressant therapy increase the risk of lymphoma? Uh, for thiopurines, I think uh, almost certainly the answer to that is yes, uh, but that risk may revert after discontinuation. For uh, TNF therapy, this is where I've sort of moved a little bit. Um, I used to be in the probably camp. I've moved to the, to the possibly camp. Um, I, I'd like to move to the no camp. Um, I need probably a little more evidence to get me there, but I'm moving closer to no. Um, and then combination therapy, uh, certainly, I think, is higher risk than monotherapy in terms of the risk of lymphoma, um, and possibly more than uh, thiopurine monotherapy based on increased immunosuppression. Given that, we still have to ask whether the benefits outweigh the risks. And so I don't want you to go through all the numbers on this, but I basically, on the back of an envelope, if you will, tried to figure out how many people would you have to treat with uh, thiopurine immunosuppressant therapy to cause somebody to die from a lymphoma. And for the moment, we're going to ignore hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma 
but we're going to look at this in young males, the group where that issue will come up. And if you go through all the calculations, you get down to showing that you'd have to treat somewhere around 20 to 25,000 people per year to cause one person to die of a lymphoma. If you keep those in mind, we'll come back to it. Um, we've also mathematically tried to uh, ask whether the risk was too much. This was a decision model um, in the pre-biologic era, asking whether thiopurine therapy uh, harms, meaning causing lymphoma, would outweigh the benefits. Um, and even in a pre-biologic era, you could see for most patients, uh, they would get more expected quality adjusted life years uh, if they took thiopurines than if they didn't. The caveat being the older you got, the more marginal that, um, that risk-benefit balance became, probably because your baseline risk of lymphoma was going up. And so if you kept tripling, that, that was going up as well. In clinical practice, um, one of the things to, that I think is really important to keep in mind is that you're going to try these therapies, whether it's combo therapy or TNF monotherapy, whatever you're going to try is going to be for a relatively short period of time before you figure out whether or not the drug works. And if it doesn't work, you're probably not going to continue it. And if you counsel patients um, using even a rough estimate that I took from Corey Siegel's meta-analysis of, say, a 1 in 2,000 um, risk of lymphoma per year, but it only takes a quarter of a year to figure out uh, whether or not the drugs are going to work, that short-term risk, I mean, we're talking about 1.25 per 10,000 subjects uh, would get an additional lymphoma because, theoretically, because of that three months of treatment. And when, if it didn't work and you stopped it, presumably that risk goes away. So then you would only continue therapy if there's documented benefit, um, and you're able to sort of make this this risk-benefit trade-off balance, knowing whether or not you're going to get better. All right, you can't give this talk without at least addressing hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. Um, there have been numerous cases of this reported to the FDA. Here's um, some summary statistics based on two publications, uh, one of them that looked at uh, spontaneous reports to the FDA. You can see there were 17 cases at that point based on thiopurine therapy alone. One, based, one in a patient treated with anti-TNF alone, and 23 in patients receiving combination therapy. So the vast, vast majority of these cases in people with IBD had received thiopurines. Um, the median age was 22.5, although the oldest was 58, but predominantly this is a, a young person's uh, bad outcome, and 93% of these were in males. The median time since initiation of thiopurines was about six years, um, so some less, some more. I tried to ask, well, how often does hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma really happen? Uh, and here are two studies, one from Kaiser Permanente, where they looked over a seven-year period. Um, and in that entire experience, the incidence rate in men was about uh, 0.4 per 100,000 person years, so, so less than one per million per year. In their population of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, they did have one person who developed this. That was uh, among 3,652 person years of thiopurine exposure. Of note, that person was on combination therapy uh, at the time. Uh, I also looked at the SASAM cohort that we talked about earlier. Interestingly, um, in over 26,000 person years of follow-up there, including nearly 17,000 uh, exposed person years, there were no cases of hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. So if you combine those together, those two studies, you have this one case out of about 20,000 person years of exposure. Um, you can do, again, some back of the envelope calculations and come up with, in males, the risk might be on the order of about 11 per 100,000 person years of thiopurine exposure. Now, I took that and added that into the slide I showed you before. So now you have... Um, this 11 per 100,000 risk of hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, which gives you a number needed to harm of about 9,000 uh, patients. And if you combine that with the other types of lymphoma people might get, you're at about um, 6,000 uh, to 7,000 people of young males treated per year to cause um, one additional death from lymphoma per year. But I want to caution you. I'm almost sure this is an overestimate of the risk, because if that's true, what I showed you, 
then it means in young males treated with thiopurines who get lymphoma that a third of them would be hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. And that seems unlikely to be the case, even though there's some challenge in actually making the diagnosis. Um, to put that in context, I just want to remind you, uh, many of you traveled here by a commercial airliner, so your risk of death from that is about one in 666,000 per year. Uh, I would imagine almost all of you routinely use a car, which puts you at about one in 9,000 people per year will die because of uh, using a car, so that's on the same magnitude of risk that we're talking about um, for adding in thiopurine therapy. Uh, by the way, if you talk on your cell phone, that bumps your risk up by an extra one per 100,000 per year. And please don't drive a motorcycle. It's an obscene amount of risk for little benefit. Um, all right, so the question, do benefits outweigh the risks? And here I think, in, for the most part, we're probably thinking about combination therapy versus monotherapy uh, with an anti-TNF drug. And I would say in most scenarios, the answer to that is probably yes. At the um, at age extremes, particularly in young males, that may not be the case. But, uh, and in the elderly, it may not be the case. But for most, in the middle ground, I think we have a sweet spot. Um, lastly, is there anything that I can do to decrease the risk of lymphoma? And this is what we all would really like to have at our disposal. Um, but we don't have a lot of great tools. Most of the lymphomas that we're thinking about in the setting of immunosuppression, we attribute to um, EBV infection, at least a, a substantial proportion of them. So let's look at a schematic of sort of what happens when people get EBV infection. So you get an acute infection and you get this, uh, this early rise in your EBV viral load. Uh, you recover and EBV goes into this sort of latency phase. Um, with immunosuppression beginning here, you begin to have this sort of early rise, and then eventually those people who would go on to have an EBV-associated lymphoma, they would have this substantial rise in their viral load. With, uh, with treatment and recovery, the viral load would again go back down to the latency phase. The theory here is that if I can capture that early rise, maybe I could intervene before my patient had a problem. Um, so why does immunosuppression matter? If you, uh, if you look at the black bars, you will see that uh, in this study, patients who uh, received more immunosuppression were more likely to have uh, detectable EBV um, than those who didn't. And in fact, the IBD patients uh, were a little more likely to have detectable EBV. Although interestingly in this study, once you had detectable EBV, the viral loads amongst the various therapies weren't, weren't so different, at least in terms of being over 500 copies uh, per ml. Um, so how could we decrease the risk? Well, one approach, obviously, is to minimize unnecessary immunosuppression. But defining unnecessary is not so, so easy. Um, there certainly is a question at hand of whether there's a role for discontinuing therapy in the setting of long-term remission. Uh, and here we might be thinking about whether you would discontinue thiopurine therapy uh, and leave people on an anti-TNF drug, or conceivably, would you discontinue the anti-TNF or both? Um, I'm not endorsing that. I'm saying it's a question that's out there for you. Uh, we also need to think about what is the minimum dose of thiopurines or methotrexate that would be needed to augment the effectiveness of anti-TNF therapy, and there are some studies ongoing looking at uh, those questions now. Uh, and lastly, is methotrexate less lymphomogenic than thiopurines and equally effective? We certainly uh, would have to pull from indirect evidence uh, to answer that question at this point, but it would be nice to... Uh, to actually see a head-to-head -head comparison of those. Um, lastly, let's look at the issue of whether we should be using EBV serology testing or monitoring EBV titers. If you look at patients who've gotten, uh, who've been followed for when they, this is actually not patients, if you look at when people get EBV infection, uh, it seems as though college is that high-risk moment. You know, you go live in a confined space, um, and these bugs get passed around. This was a study from a very long time ago where they looked at uh, Yale freshmen, Yale graduates who were a little bit older, so 21 to 26, and some Peace Corps volunteers who were 
20 to 34, and you can see that enormous bump up in the proportion of people who had evidence of prior infection between when they came to college and when they were recent graduates. We also know that in the post-transplant setting that there's a greater risk of developing post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder in children, the elderly, and in EBV seronegative patients. So the top table uh, shows you the incidence of this in people getting kidney, bone marrow, liver, and heart or lung transplants overall, and then if you look in the far column, in children. And so one of the things that you see is the incidence rates were uniformly higher in children. And one plausible explanation here is obviously that the children had not yet had EBV infection when they were transplanted. The bottom table shows you uh, the incidence of this in studies of kidney transplant recipients. And here you see um, at the other end of the spectrum that the elderly were more likely to develop PTLD. Um, and equally or more important for our discussion that the EBV seronegative uh, recipients were more likely to develop PTLD. So we have um, some evidence that EBV infection is common and typically occurs early in life, uh, particularly around college age, that seronegative transplant recipients have a higher risk of PTLD, and that de novo infection while you're immunosuppressed is associated with a higher incidence of lymphoma. So if that's the case, should we test EBV serologies prior to treating young patients um, and withhold thiopurines if they're EBV seronegative. Um, I don't have an answer for you, but I would say occasionally I do this. Um, should we monitor EBV titers during therapy? This is based on what happens in the post-transplant world. The problem is we don't have any proven early interventions to prevent PTLD other than taking away immunosuppression. Um, However, early detection of PTLD is associated with better outcomes in the post-transplant setting, largely because of favor more favorable histology and genetic profile. Indeed, some of the organ and bone marrow transplant uh, guidelines have recommended early aggressive monitoring of high-risk patients. High-risk meaning people who've had splenectomy, re uh, received T-cell depletion, or used uh, ATG or OKT3. Um, Obviously, we don't do that in, in our people. Um, there are no guidelines on this for uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And I would argue to you that I think this is unlikely to ever be cost effective and possibly even feasible for a few reasons. Um, one, I think our IBD patients are getting less immunosuppression than these people uh, who are getting organ transplant uh, and therefore uh, the risk is probably lower. Um, the other thing is they're getting essentially the same level of immunosuppression for very long periods of time. So is this really practical to be doing uh, over uh, an extended period of time? As final take-home points for you, um, I think we can probably all agree that thiopurines increase the risk of lymphoma. As I said, I've moved from probably to possibly in the anti-TNF space. Um, I continue to echo the theory that, uh, you know, a short trial of therapy has very little long-term risk of lymphoma and can really inform the risk-benefit balance. You're no longer making a decision about this might make you better. It either made you better or it didn't. Um, we should be thinking about discontinuing ineffective medications unless you can justify continuing them for another reason. In our setting, this is often for the issues of trying to prevent antibody formation, but I think you should uh, think carefully about that decision. Uh, and I would conclude with saying that while uh, the benefits of combination therapy versus monotherapy likely uh, outweigh the harms in, in most cases, Additional caution may be warranted in, um, in young EBV serology negative patients, young males in particular, um, and in the elderly. Thank you very much.